Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Thank you for joining us for this post-argument episode of SCOTUScast. I'm your host, Spencer Karen. On May 4th, 2021, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in Terry v. United States. The question before the court was whether pre-August 3rd, 2010, crack offenders sentenced under Section 841B1C have a covered offense under Section 404 of the First Step Act. Vakrant Reddy, Senior Research Fellow at the Charles Koch Institute, joins us today to discuss this case's oral argument. This is a really interesting case to talk about. It's hyper-technical, there's no doubt about it. But to really understand the case, you've got to talk about some bigger things, things that touch on American social history and crime and politics and Congress. And uh, fundamentally, I think, uh, every Fed soccer's favorite topic, which is statutory interpretation. Uh, and at the end of all of it, the lives of, of possibly hundreds of people uh, are implicated. And so um, it's just an absolutely fascinating uh, little case, and I say we dig into it. So you dig into it not really by starting with the case, but you start by thinking about the crack epidemic in the United States in the 1980s. Uh, Everybody knows that we had a horrible crime situation at that time. Urban crime was, was really spiraling out of control, and much of the crime of that period was connected to the drug trade and drug markets. Uh, and in, uh, for that reason, we passed some very, very harsh drug penalties, uh, many of which remain with us today. And the United States has got, broadly speaking, many penalties about the state and federal level for narcotics that are far higher than uh, you find in uh, many other comparable nations. Our penalties for crack were particularly high. There was a sense based on Uh, our best understanding at that time, that crack was a uniquely dangerous drug, uh, that it was connected to violence in the drug markets in a way that uh, dramatically outstripped other drugs, that it was uniquely addictive, that it had, uh, that it carried unique public health concerns. And so crack penalties were particularly high. In fact, we made crack penalties uh, approximately 100 times higher than the penalties for uh, cocaine offenses. Uh, and that was our best understanding at the time, that crack was just a much more serious issue than cocaine. Uh, so this means that if you were to receive one month in prison, in federal prison for some kind of a, a cocaine offense, you would get a little bit more than eight years for a comparable crack offense. I mean, the the disparity was just massive. It was extraordinary. Now, as time went by and our scientific understanding improved and our kind of cultural understanding improved, uh, we began to really, really rethink those 100 to that 100 to one ratio between cocaine and crack. And for people who were working in the criminal justice space, one of the most important uh, goals was to find a way to reduce the 100 to 1 crack cocaine disparity. In 2010, we finally did. Not all the way, but significantly. The uh, ratio was reduced from about 100 to 1 to about 17 to 1. So now you're at a point where a cocaine crime that would get you one month behind bars would be matched by a uh, crack penalty of about a year and a half. Still a big deal, but nothing like that previous 100 to 1 ratio. Now, there was an important exception to uh, the statutory change that was made in, in 2010, the Fair Sentencing Act, as it was called, and that exception is that the law was not made retroactive. So for all these people who had already been sentenced under this very, very harsh crack regime, 
they were simply uh, out of luck. And so now the new goal of people in the criminal justice reform community was to find a way to get the Fair Sentencing Act made retroactive. Again, it took quite a long time, but in 2018, they succeeded because Congress passed and Donald Trump signed into law the First Step Act, which just about everybody on the call probably remembers, remembers as a really landmark uh, federal criminal justice uh, reform legislation. The uh, First Step Act did a whole lot of things, but for our purposes on the call today, the really interesting thing that it did was it took the Fair Sentencing Act, which reduced the crack cocaine disparities from 100 to 1 to 17 to 1, and it made them retroactive. So suddenly you have thousands of people who are in federal prison who are in a position to petition the courts to recalculate their sentences and say, look, I, I had been previously sentenced to X, but now I should be sentenced to something that is, you know, uh, months, really even years lower. And, and some people are in a position to be released immediately because uh, the sentence uh, had been recalculated. Now, one of the people who presumably was in a position to get his sentence reassessed was a man named Tariq Terry. And uh, when he was about 20 years old in Miami, he was found with approximately four grams of crack. Uh, they said in the court arguments today that that could be estimated at a street value of about $50 or so. It's a very tiny amount. It weighs about what a paper clip could weigh. But ever since then, he has been in federal prison. He thought that he was in a position to perhaps get his sentence reassessed. But here's where things start to get complicated and things get a little bit technical. Um, and as I said at the beginning, this, this gets into a really technical question of statutory interpretation. I'll, I'll get into this as best I can. We created, when we made these uh, really harsh crack penalties back in the 1980s, three different tiers. So the highest tier, the most significant kinds of crack offenses involved uh, amounts of crack that were 50 grams or higher. And then there was a middle tier, and that was for anywhere from 5 grams to 50 grams. And then there was the lowest tier of all, and that was below 5 grams. So the Fair Sentencing Act comes along in 2010, and it elevates uh, all of these. The highest tier, we decide, is uh, no longer needs to be 50. It probably should be something more like 280. And then the middle tier gets bumped up. It's no longer 5 to 50. It's 28 grams to 280 grams. Now, the lowest tier of all, the one that was previously 5 and below, that was not actually mentioned. Now, in a sense, it's implicated, right? Because if the middle tier goes up uh, from 5 to 28 at the lowest bound, then that means that the lower tier necessarily isn't, uh, isn't capped at 5. It's capped at 28 now. It has been kind of folded in, even if it wasn't explicitly stated. Uh, by implication, it's affected. Everybody seems to agree on that. But here's what they don't agree on. Was it, was this uh, small provision, this uh, lowest tier offense, was it quote unquote modified? That's the word that everybody uh, is uh, arguing about right now. That's what the, the court was trying to get a handle on this morning. The reason the word modified is so important is that you are in a position to have your sentence reassessed under the First Step Act if you uh, committed a crime that is a quote-unquote covered offense. And a covered offense is one, among other things, that was, quote, modified by the Fair Sentencing Act in 2010. Now, it wasn't actually this particular subsection of the statute wasn't mentioned. Congress didn't touch it. So in that sense, it wasn't directly modified. But of course, it did change. It was altered simply because um, the, the penalty level above it was altered. And so in that sense, it was modified. So you kind of ask yourself, well, what does the word modified mean? And does it really apply to this section of the statute? Well, uh, Four senators who were uh, deeply involved in the First Step Act, uh, I think it was Mike Lee, Chuck Grassley, both FedSoc guys, and then uh, on the Democratic side, Dick Durbin, and one other senator I don't recall, Cory Booker, it's Cory Booker, uh, four senators altogether, they filed an amicus brief in which they argued that, uh, yes, obviously this was modified, 
you can't think that Congress's intent in um, uh, in passing the First Step Act was to somehow cut a break for the highest and most serious crack offenders, the El Chapos of the world, but to remain very, very hard and very, very tough on the lowest level crack offenders, the people who are more likely mules or, you know, uh, possession offenders, this kind of thing. And uh, they said it would just be a really kind of quixotic reading of the statute. But of course, uh, what the court is focused on is what the text of the statute says, not what four senators after the fact uh, say that Congress intended to say. Um, Justice Scalia uh, taught us uh, all about the perils of, of relying too much on legislative history. And so I think at the, end of the, at, at the end of the day, the court is just going to take a look at the words on the page. But there, uh, we still don't really have a good answer to our question, because we don't know whether or not the, the First Step Act's uh, use of the word modified is going to uh, implicate this small subsection of the crack penalty statute. And that is what the case is going to be decided on. And I really don't know how it's going to go. I, I thought when I first started investigating this case that it would be a slam dunk for Mr. Terry and that he would win it. But I, I really started digging into the arguments and, and listening, by the way, to the court this morning, where even uh, a judge like Justice Sotomayor, who you would think would... Um, would be kind of a, an anti-government position here. Uh, she nevertheless seemed very dubious uh, of Mr. Terry's argument. So uh, ultimately, I guess I'm not entirely sure where it's going to go. I'm really interested in seeing where Justice Gorsuch lands, because he's one of the most interesting voices on the court on criminal justice matters, and this is a criminal justice case, and also on statutory interpretation and textualism matters. And he uh, is also one of the most influential and interesting voices on the court uh, in that arena. And uh, Gorsuch didn't really show his hand today because, uh, as Justice Roberts, during the telephone arguments, went one by one asking who had questions, Justice Thomas and uh, Justice Breyer, et cetera, et cetera. But he got to Gorsuch, and Gorsuch passed. He did not ask any questions. So we just don't really know um, quite what he's thinking at the moment. But uh, that's, that's where the case uh, is right now. It's, it was very interesting that they heard it in the first place. They normally wouldn't hear a case this late, but um, the, uh, the government had petitioned them uh, to hear the case uh, in kind of an extraordinary circumstance, simply because there are so many people, federal inmates, whose lives would be uh, implicated here. And I should note, by the way, there's an interesting little wrinkle in uh, the representation in this case, because... Uh, originally, when this case came before the court, the Department of Justice uh, took the position that um, that subsection of that crack statute was not modified, and therefore Mr. Terry was not in a position to have his sentence reassessed. But just a few, uh, just a few short weeks later, the administration changed from Trump to Biden, and the Biden administration said that it actually was not going to take that position. It was going to just step aside and support Mr. Terry. And so what the court had to do was hire an amicus. And I forget the uh, attorney's name, though he did an able job today. He was a former clerk to Justice Thomas. Uh, they got an amicus to represent the, the anti-Terry position. And we will see uh, how, it, how it's ultimately decided. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. SCOTUScast is a project of the Federalist Society, a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia.
This has been a FedSoc audio production.